Uh, hey, go and grab your Bible. You can turn to, yeah, we're in the book of Proverbs, all right? Hey, um, got, a, got a question for you as we start. So we got a lot more knowledge today than we've ever had, more information coming at us. Um, uh, but are we wiser than we used to be? Buckminster Fuller um, was a futurist uh, back in the 1900s. Some of y'all were alive or back then. Um, and uh, like, like, like born, I think, 1870-something. But he, he wrote a book called The Critical Path. He was, a, he was a futurist, inventor, thinker. And he said that for the first 1,500 years after Christ, um, knowledge doubled. Uh, now, imagine what happened right about 1,500. Um, then for, he said for the next, next 250 years, it doubled again. And then by 1945, um, the doubling rate of knowledge was at 25 years. Now, I don't know how they measure, measure this stuff. Because now, I went on and said, well, I wonder what it is now. And so I'm, I'm looking at this, and some say it's like every 10 to 12 years, knowledge information in the world doubles. Uh, now some are saying, I've read that some are saying, no, it's more like every 12 hours. Or we're fast moving that way. 12, every 12 hours, knowledge in the world doubles. And this fast rate of knowledge and information that's coming to us, I could, we could all argue, I think, it's kind of technology has has outpaced our ability to use it effectively. It's outpaced our character, right? Uh, herein lies the difference between knowledge and wisdom. You may have heard that, that wisdom is applied knowledge. You can have knowledge without wisdom. We see that in spades in our day. We, are, we all have it in our own lives. Like I know more than I obey, right? Even from the Word of God. You can't have wisdom without knowledge. Because there is this knowledge of a particular subject that you have to know in order to then have wisdom, know how to, how to manage wisdom. We're calling this um, series um, Ancient Wisdom for, a moder- for Modern Times. And the moment that I say ancient, a lot of us think, we, if, if we're honest, we think something so ancient, um, like this is, we're talking about Solomon back uh, you know, back a thousand years, like 900 some odd BC, we're talking about a long time ago. And, and if we're not careful, we think what, what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. That if it's not the newest, latest, most recent thing, then it's out of date. It's discredited. It's called recency bias. I heard David French talking about this. He's written about it, a cultural commentator who said, here's the problem in our day. Now, with algorithms and such, you Google something, and what happens is the most recent information shows up on the page, where what you really might need to be reading is far down several pages. Look up something on wisdom, and the Kardashians show up. I mean, you know, like, well, how does this happen, right? Um, I mean, it's, uh, maybe it has something to do with my algorithms. I don't know what that's about. But that, that I mean, you, you, you can't find the information you're actually looking for. Oftentimes, the information that's coming at you is not going to help you a whole lot. So how do we discern all of this stuff? And we see it in, in, in so many ways in our culture. We all do this. We see it, um, we, we're bent towards technology, right? Latest iPhone comes out, got to get it, because it's the latest, newest one, right? Uh, we see it in sports, where like, who's the goat? And there's recency bias. Some of y'all think that LeBron is the greatest NBA player of all time, and you're dead wrong, because it's Jordan who is the greatest player of all time. Um, and even there, though, like, okay, that, that was more like my era, you know, and, and so I'm more familiar with that, right? And so what we've got to have is this humility that says, maybe I don't know all things, and we wrestle with that in our day, don't we? Um, there was a TED Talk done years ago where the gal asked the question at the beginning. I've, I've asked you this question before, but what does it feel like to be wrong? Um, and, you know, we could say, well, that's embarrassing, when you're wrong. It's shameful. It feels like I didn't do my homework. I mean, I don't like being wrong. And she notes, no, 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 no. What does it feel like to be wrong? Exactly what it feels like to be right. Exactly the same. Because you're wrong and you don't know it when you think you're right. And what happens is the Proverbs teach us that that there's a way to live that's wise and then the opposite of that Really, the default mode for us is foolish living. And we've all been there before. We all wrestle with what is it to be wise in particular decisions? How can the Proverbs help us? If you're like me, you think of the Proverbs being all these little pithy statements, one after another, and they're disconnected. And a lot of Proverbs is that. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. 
And so what we're going to do, here's how you read the Proverbs. We're going to teach you how to read the Proverbs. But we're going we're gonna to take particular topics. Okay, We're going to talk about family. We're going to talk about work. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about all kinds of things because what we do is we're going to pull Proverbs from, from really all over the place and uh, throughout the book. And it gives you this multifaceted view of a particular subject. But it's also to be read right chronologically, like in order, along the way. But as we'll discover today, understanding the Proverbs is like, like a puzzle. Uh, multifaceted ways to understand what is this wisdom of God. So this ancient wisdom for modern times is going to help us in everyday living. And uh, what I want us to do is to turn, you can go ahead and turn to Proverbs 2 is where we're going to be. Because we're seeing that our, our technology and our wisdom outpaces our, our character in so many ways. I see this in ministry. I see young leaders who, who, are, who are raised up and they, they get this platform. All you need is a phone, right? I got a platform. I'm going to tell you what's up. And I'm, I'm an influencer, right? Um, or I'm a thought leader. Y'all, if that's on your profile, take it down. Thank you, please. <laughs> like, you want a thought leader? Uh, Jesus, a thought leader. So um, you got that going on. But what happens is too often we get this platform and we confuse this calling uh, with, without character, and we see people spinning out. We got these, you know, celebrity pastors and, and whoever else. And we all need to be on guard. But we see that our, 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 our possibilities are way outpacing our, our character. So we may be smarter. We may have more knowledge. But we are not wiser. And some of us can look back. Like I would ask you, are you wiser than, say, the generation before you or, the, or a couple generations before you? And that's, that seems to, seems to be our context. If you're like me, I like great-grandparents. Now, wait, what are their names? Again? Who were they? Where did they come from, right? And are, are, are limited, even in our scope of knowledge. And, and this, this is a book that's, that really is for all of us. But teenagers, young people, this is for you. This is written for you, as we'll see today. From a father to a son, primarily. You could say father, mother, to daughters and sons as well. So we just finished this whole um, series on Galatians, as Rebecca noted, and uh, we've been talking about the explicit gospel. Now, we don't move away from that. That's all we've got. I noted last week that a lot of Christians have come to believe that we, we, our role, our mission in the world is to moralize everybody, like to tell you, you're wrong, you're wrong, and you're wrong, and you're jacked up, and you're messed up. And that's a really bad evangelism strategy, by the way. It just doesn't work real well. And so we've said, well, 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 our mission is then to tell people about the fact that we're all morally bankrupt. We can't save ourselves. And, and instead, we need a Savior who comes to rescue us. And that's what Christ has done for us. He took your sin upon the cross. And, and so that you can be totally forgiven. And even before that, he lived the perfect life for us. And I say all this because once saved then, once we come to Christ, if you have, once you come to Christ, you have now the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit, Holy Spirit in you, that allows you then to discern. You've got these, these antennae up, spiritual antennae. So Proverbs comes right on the heels of the gospel, if you will, that tells us how do you live with wisdom and discernment in life. And we have the benefit, the bonus of the Holy Spirit in us if you have received Christ. But what we're going to see today is, is that the, 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 the wisdom that comes from Proverbs will, will help, help us to, to get the wisdom that we need. There's benefits for it. And uh, we're going to talk about how, how it comes with a challenge too. So I'll break it down this way. If you take notes, wisdom is a gift. Okay. We'll see here today. Wisdom is a guide. Uh, you probably guessed that one. And wisdom is a grind because it takes place in real day day to day life. So first look at this. Wisdom is a gift. Again, this is from King Solomon to his son. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. My son, if watch this conditional kind of propositional statements he's making here. If 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 you receive, there it is. It's a gift. You if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, Yes, if you call out for insight, notice the progression, raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, operative phrase, and find the knowledge of God. So you can see the if-then. It moves from passive, 
Watch this. Here's how you, here's, again, here's how you read Scripture. What's going on here? Let's think deeply about it. Let's meditate on it. This is how you enter into your, your quiet time in Scripture when your, your pastor or preacher is not around to tell you to think about this. You dig deeper. Look at, look at the conditions. Okay, wait, there's if then. That's worth noting. But there's also progression. First, he says, listen. Okay, incline your heart. What is this? There's a bias. There's a leaning towards God and his wisdom. There's this, this inclination. There's a tendency, a disposition towards God. Now, in Christ, every one of us should have that as Christians. Like, I'm always leaning first, not last, first to God. When I have a decision to make, when I sense some anxiety, what's going on in my life? What does God say about this? Not, what does my favorite, you know, person in the world or podcast or whatever else tell me? What does God say about this? And here's what I'd like to ask you today. Um, This past week, okay, so I'm challenging you in the week ahead. Did you live that way this week? Like, is your default mode to go to God, to lean towards him? Because here's the thing we're going to learn about wisdom. Those who are wise seek after wisdom, and they want more wisdom. It's why, here we go, if you're wise, you're listening to this message in view of application in your life. That's wisdom. If you're just checking out for a moment, go, okay, we're in God's word, but I don't know, the Proverbs, I don't know about this. I got other things on my mind. I could argue that, okay, that's foolish. Does this describe you? Do you have an inclination? Are you constantly seeking, leading, you know, leaning in? And notice too, look at this. It says that it's hidden treasure. Did you catch that? Hidden treasure. That doesn't mean it's like it's hiding out. That means it is precious. It's extremely valuable. When you have hidden treasure, you, you, you look at it, you put it on display, you hold it out there, you want people to see it, you'll scrutinize it, you look at it, and that's what the Proverbs do. It's like refracted light that comes at us. Each proverb is like a puzzle, which is why you can't just read through them, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Instead, you stop and go, what is happening here? So we'll talk about that in, in, the, in the days to come. How many of you, anybody do Wordle in here? You do Wordle, anybody? Some of you are obsessed with Wordle? Um, can I challenge you uh, in the days to come? Here's a little application. How about read a proverb or a chapter? You can get through, right, 31 in a, in a month. Read a chapter of Proverbs before you do Wordle. And try to, try to figure out the proverb. Because each one is like a puzzle. Maybe you do crossword puzzles, or a lot of us, we love to read. Maybe you read a, a certain paper or papers or, or, or blog post or whatever else. I want to challenge you, dive into the scriptures Because it's a lot of fun to figure out the proverb and what is being said here. We also have our resource guide, by the way, sermon resource guide on on our website. You can go to the wise person says, I want to go deeper. Like today, you're going to hear some things. I've only got so much time, right? You're going to hear some things. I want to go deeper there. I need more of that. I need wisdom on how I can make decisions about this. But what is this, this fear of the Lord? This is critical to understanding the Proverbs, okay? Proverbs 1, 7 and 9, you can see it on the screen there, says this. The fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland around your head and pendants around your neck. It's like, put it on. This stuff is good. You're looking good with this on. So teenagers, young people, children, this is what uh, the Proverbs are about. A loving father, that should change the way you read this, coming to a loving son or daughter, like the rest of us, all of us here, God's word coming to us. I remember when I went to college, um, my freshman year, I don't remember exactly when it was, might have been spring break, coming home, and I realized my dad had gotten like 20 years younger and about 30 years smarter. And I didn't know how in the world that happened. Um, And, of course, he didn't change. I changed. I was like, wow, I'm out in the big, bad world. And my parents, the godly wisdom and counsel they brought to me was spot on. And when all, and, and teenagers, when your parents don't do this and don't do that, and we're going to have guardrails here, and we love you so much, we're going to guide you. It all starts with, with this humility. And a lot of us don't have it. It starts with reverence of God. The operative, the, the singular verse, you could argue, key verse in, uh, in all of Proverbs, but it's said over and over again, you kind of just heard it, is, is Proverbs 9.10. It 
says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Okay, knowledge of, we said you gotta have knowledge in order to have wisdom, but this Hebrew word for wisdom is hokmah. Everybody say hokmah. Okay, there you go. You know some Hebrew. Um, it means, and it means moral living, but really, um, Proverbs really is how to live the good life. Like how to flourish in life is what it's about. A lot of us aren't doing that so much. The word hokmah is much more than that. It, it's, it's the knowledge of the Lord plus obedience. It's like the word shema. Everybody knows shema, right? Say shema. Shema. Okay, now you know two Hebrew words. Shema is, is, um, is what it's called. The, what is it? Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel. The word hear. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is one. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, the word Shema has at its root, the word is hear, okay, not just listen, but hear and obey. Same word, same root word. In the Hebraic mind, watch this, to hear something was to obey it. If you didn't obey it, put it into action, you didn't hear it. So it's only really in the global West or in you know, modern, there's a lot of history behind this, how we got to a point where I can believe that. I'm totally on board with that. I get it. I, I intellectually understand it. Has no impact on my life. There's this, there's this disconnect between knowledge received and then wisdom that's lived out. Okay, So wisdom is a gift. It comes from God. It's not unlike peace. C.S. Lewis said that um, you, know, you can't experience peace apart from God. Because it comes from him, so you must come to him to get it. In the same way, wisdom works that way. You've got to have this fear of the Lord. I'm going to talk more about that here in a moment. So wisdom is a gift. Secondly, wisdom is a guide. All right, look at verse 6. Wisdom is a guide. For the Lord gives wisdom. There it is again. He gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Notice that he is a shield. Guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Wisdom provides shield and protection, guardrails for all of us. And so parents, let me ask you, what do your kids need more than wisdom as they enter into life? Knowing how to make wise decisions. That's what parenting is all about, right? I'm trying to teach you how to make wise decisions so when you're not around anymore, you're not going to just be a fool. Sorry, but we don't, I don't want you to run away as a fool. And so now, though, listen, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you have received the grace of God, and by faith, you've said, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I receive your gift of grace. I repent of my sin. I am helpless without you. You receive his grace. At the same time, watch this, you enter into what's been called this, this Trinitarian dance. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're invited into this relationship with God Almighty, and His Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit guides us and leads us. Now we have this wise guide who is in our hearts, and it says that God fills us with His Spirit. But look at this, to walk with, with integrity. He becomes a personal guide for us in the way of Jesus is what this means. What is integrity? It's the life of Jesus. Integrity, here it is, and Proverbs is a lot about integrity. Um, it's, it's integrated is what that is. It's an integrated life. It's wholeness. It's goodness really across the board. And it's a fruit of the spirit. Remember, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Goodness means like good to the core. It means that, it, that you have this kind of wisdom. If you're walking with the Lord, inclined towards this kind of life, you become intrinsically good. Not that you are good, but the spirit has transformed your heart so you can live this way. Now look, what does this look like? Then, here's the if, 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 then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. Now these are key words that we see throughout the book of Proverbs is why we're in this text right here. You'll, you'll understand Sedek um, is righteousness. You often hear that righteousness and justice are almost interchangeable. This is, the justice is the word mishpat in, in the Hebrew. Um, and then there's equity. There's another word for equality. This is the word equity. This is meshaw, meshaw in the, in the Hebrew, which is, um, which is this wise discernment. Here it is. Wise people discern the difference and pursue equity 
for those who are in need, who are, in, who are vulnerable. This is what we're talking about. This is debated in our culture a lot in these days. Um, this past uh, Friday, um, I was here uh, helping host an event that we had. We, we hosted um, this, this group that was here called Council for Life. We had 60 plus uh, different agencies here. Council for Life is essentially this group that raises, I think, like a million dollars this year to then disperse to different agencies, these life-giving agencies that come alongside parents, that come alongside moms and, and dads, come along and, and, and babies to provide the hope and, and healing and, and guidance for, for the future. Stepping into that space, we wondered, what does a post row world look like? Well, we've, we say it looks like it looks like life from the womb to the tomb and everywhere in between. And, and you know, I challenge my, my conservative friends often with in those conversations, which we're talking about in our apologetics class, by the way, um, next couple of weeks, you can come join us. But uh, among other things, but, um, I, I, you know, my, the conservative uh, and, and I say that whether it's politically, ideolo- ideologically or just traditionalist types who I would say um, the question is, are you pro birth or are you pro life? Because one has to do with the whole, you know, aspect of the continuum of life. And then I ask my, my progressive friends is and I have a lot of them. Uh, I ask, well, OK, wait, are you? Are you pro-abortion or are you pro-choice? Because that's something else altogether different, right? So much education needs to take place. Now, I get off on that because what happens is wisdom is not simply, here it is, wisdom is not simply for my own personal flourishing. Wisdom is to help others flourish. Wisdom seeks righteousness, justice, and equity, in every good path. See, biblical wisdom leads not only to my own flourishing, but to the flourishing of others. So any concept of justice that is not fundamentally rooted in, in this principle truth of equity will never lead to equality. And this is the way of Jesus. We, and we do it in our own lives. We do it in personal uh, our relationships and our families. We often will dip down to the most vulnerable. We do it among uh, the elderly, those who are in need, those who can't care for themselves. And so we step into every good path with wisdom that the Proverbs gives, the Word of God gives us. And, and Meshaw is this idea that we're going to help raise everybody up. Wisdom results in the flourishing of everybody around us. And uh, so don't miss that. We can, we can just say, well, this is good for me. It's going to help me flourish and live the good life. But the good life in Christ is always lived out for the sake of others. So here we go. If all this wisdom is so good, here's the question I'm going to ask you. And then preemptively, as we move into the week, are you asking God for it? If it's a gift and it comes from him, are you constantly pursuing wisdom from God? James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, do you know this verse? Let him ask. And what does it say? God will give it freely and abundantly. He is not stingy with his wisdom. But again, longing for relationship, and because we have relationship in him, we come to him for it. And and yet too often our pride, like in every aspect of life, steps into the way, gets in our way. Students, where do you need wisdom? Young adults, in what area of life do you need wisdom in decision making? I mean, there's a million decisions to make, right? Um, Parents, grandparents, all of us here, where do you need wisdom? And I want to challenge you this week to ask God for wisdom in your workplace, in decisions you're making. Seek wisdom, and he gives it freely, and as he does, embrace it. But the problem for so many of us is is this pride. It's this uh, lack of what... um, what uh, Haidt and, and Lukanoff in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, they talk about this lack of intellectual, um, this lack of intellectual humility in our world today. Because we have so much information. I can figure it out on my own when you can't. Um, and, and, in, and, and they have an entire chapter in there called Wiser Kids. I mean, a whole thing on wisdom. And, and not, 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 not biblical per se or Christ-centered, But it's interesting that when I read books like that, I'm like helping me understand culture, how we got to where we are. But I'm like, okay, you guys, y'all, just read the Bible. 
like, y'all, like, like you're saying what's already thousands of years ago. This stuff has been written. And so this week, here's the challenge. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Wisdom is a gift. It's a guide. And we'll close with this. It is a grind because it works out in daily life. He says, you'll understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For, here it is, verse 10, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. I love this. It'll flood your heart. So that's, again, you'll be intrinsically good. Uh, it'll, it'll infiltrate your, your, your soul, the goodness of God and his wisdom. Verse 11, discretion. Watch these words. We don't use these words often, showing how radical Proverbs really is and how radical the wisdom of God is. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guide you. Discretion really is, uh, here's another word we don't use a lot, circumspection. It's like looking at all the possibilities, covering you know, certain circumstances and looking at all the possible consequences. That's what wisdom is. Some of you know people like this. Are you like that? In other words, it's being prudent. We don't use that word a whole lot. The, the, this is how the scriptures guide us differently. It will guard you, it says. It protects you. And this is what we're, we're seeking as parents all the time, right? And, and even if you, you're not a parent, just seeking wisdom. Look at verse 12. Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who walk in the ways of darkness, and then who rejoice in doing evil. Really? Delight in the, in the uh, perversiveness of evil. Men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Now, what we'll see, and in, in if you've read Proverbs, we'll see it as we move forward. There's two um, kind of representative allegorical or, or metaphorical characters in, throughout Proverbs. It's the evil men, okay, fools, and uh, the adulteress, okay? Remember, kind of primarily to a son, but this is for all of us, sons and daughters. And, and they, they really represent all kinds of temptations. That's what it is. They represent all kinds of temptations that come our way, but if you've noticed the scriptures, and even, even you could say, well, I don't know. There, now, there's a lot of detail here in Proverbs, but you've all done what I've done. Like, Lord, um, why didn't you show us, like, tell us how we're supposed to use the Internet? Uh, you know, how do we do that? Or why didn't you tell us more about dating? Like, well, you don't have specifics on a lot of things about dating. and I mean, all kinds of things, right? A lot of decisions you're making. Well, here's how the proverb plays out. Proverbs comes to the rescue. Because David Kidner, who wrote a, a well-known pro, uh, Proverbs common commentary, he describes it this way. He says, the ro- Proverbs' role in our relationship with God and the world is like this. There are details of character small enough to escape the mesh of the law, okay? And broadsided the prophets, he says, by the way, and broadsides us in our personal dealings. He says, Proverbs moves into this realm asking what a person is like to live with. What a person is like to be married to. What a person is like to work with or to employ. What a person is like to have as a friend. The Proverbs help us navigate these gray areas of life. Another commentator, Bruce Waltke, probably the best commentary on Proverbs, he dives into, and I want to wrap up with this, he goes into the fear of the Lord, um, where he says that it's both rational and emotive. And I want to kind of help us land with this. He says that the fear of the Lord is to submit to the will of God in, in a covenant relationship. It goes back with Moses, right? Who, who the fear of the Lord, you see throughout the Exodus story and throughout the Old Testament. But now we come into relationship with Christ under the new, new covenant where Christ steps in. He takes on our punishment. Okay, he becomes the Passover lamb for us. Now we submit our will to him and the way of Jesus. And so there's this covenant relationship, that, that this fear of the Lord. We often think of fear as something, we're afraid of something bad's going to happen. This is not what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is this reverence of a God who would come to us in the person of Jesus. What happens when we fail, though? Let's talk about it. Because we have all done foolish things. Well, I mean, we've all made decisions that have been so foolish, every one of us, that have hurt us. And hurt others around us. And we can't shake it. Because here's the thing. You're not going to be saved through wise living. You don't follow the Proverbs and suddenly I've arrived. 
So how do we deal with our struggle and lack of wisdom along the way? And we're going to fail. We're going to be foolish. We're going to be fools sometimes. And the Bible says in Isaiah 11, listen to this language. This is a prophecy of Christ coming. There shall come forth a, a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. Now listen to this. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and check it out, the fear of the Lord. And have you ever thought about it? The total fear of the Lord will be upon, will be upon the Messiah. And his delight, look at this, shall be the fear of the Lord. Wait, what? Fear, delight, what is going on here? He shall not judge by what, he, what his eyes see and decide disputes by what his ears hear. He's going to judge from the heart because he is, watch this, Jesus comes. He is our perfect wisdom. He lives, watch this, he's the one who hears the voice of the Father and obeys him completely. He is the obedient son who never steps off the path. He's the one who lives this perfect life of wisdom for us. Christ becomes our wisdom. I came across this verse this week. I'm sure I've read it before. But Psalm 130 verse 4, it says this to make the point. For with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. What? See, the fear of the Lord is this awe before a God who is perfect, righteous, holy, never makes a a wrong decision. He he hates sin. And and we stand before him knowing that he loves us, knows everything about me, and yet still loves me. I stand in awe. You can say, I stand in fear and reverence of that God. I don't want to offend him ever. Not because his punishment is going to come to me because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. His punishment has gone to his son. Well, then why obey? I can just live like I want to live because you'd be a fool for one and you don't get it. The more you understand the grace of God and what he's done for you, the more you're going to obey him. The more you capture the grace of God and what he has done for you because the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross is how you got to this new position, this new identity. That is a God that you fear. You don't ever want. You're afraid to step out of bounds before that God because you love him so much. Wisdom is no longer a personal force. It's not a, I mean, impersonal force. It's not a higher ethic. Look at verse uh, verse 30, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And because of him, you are in Christ because of what he's done, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness from God, sanctification and redemption. That wraps up the entire gospel and all of our lives. There's no condemnation for those of us who fail, but we keep getting back on track. And if you're here today and you're going, Jeff, I've hurt some people. I mean, I've made some foolish decisions in my life. And I'm still paying the price in some way. Our sin has consequences. That's a lot of what Proverbs is about. But what do you do? Here's the thing. I'll close with these application points before we partake of the Lord's Supper together. The wise person knows they're a sinner in need of grace. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. The wise person desires wisdom. Do you want more of it? You say, well, how would I know? Are you seeking it out in his word constantly? Are you spending time in his word? If not, sorry, fool. I just called you a fool. You're being foolish. He's given you his wisdom and his word. Are you applying it to your life? And are you in a group? Are you doing this with other people? Big part of Proverbs. Don't be walking with with the evil ones, those who are not pursuing wisdom, the wisdom of God. Get in a community. Somebody need to do what others have done today. You need to join the church. The wisest thing you can do today is come join the church. Be in covenant relationship with others. The wisest thing you can do is get in a connect group. But for some of us, the wisest thing you can do is is start serving other people, not just for you, but for others. Are you being discipled by others? You're wise. Are you discipling others? So look, wise living will not save you. It's not going to happen. 